morning, Sardis. I'm delighted to see you all here and to welcome you to Sardis Baptist as we begin our morning worship service. I'd like to invite you all to stand as we sing the hymn, He Lives. Will you stand with me and sing? being seated and as our pastor comes up I'd like to invite all the men next week for our Father's Day we traditionally try to have a men's choir so I'd like to invite you all to come up to the choir loft before the service next week um, and we will be singing Rise Up O Men of God which is a song that you will know so look forward to that. Amen. Well good morning Sardis Church it is good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, if you're a visitor with us, we especially welcome you into our service this morning. And I hope when you came in, you received the bulletin. And on that bulletin, you'll find a little tear-off if you'll just jot a little bit of information down about yourself to let us know you were here and on your way out. Uh, there'll be a greeter there at the door, and they'll be happy to give you a little gift bag. And you can just uh, exchange that strip for a gift bag. And that's just uh, a small token of our appreciation uh, for you being here today. Uh, but before we pray for our service, I do want to thank everyone who participated in uh, the VBS this past week. Uh, we, had, uh, we had a lot of kids here. We do know of, there was one young lady who uh, prayed to receive Christ, and uh, she, was, uh, she was adamant about it. I had the opportunity to talk with her and spend some time with her and uh, ask her a lot of really hard questions, and she answered them better than a lot of adults I talked to, so I was very very pleased. So she prayed to receive Christ. So we give God all the glory for that. We'll be setting up a time uh, for her baptism this morning. I'd also ask one other thing uh, before we go to the Lord in prayer. That this week, uh, this coming week, that you guys be in prayer uh, for our Southern Baptist Convention. We have our annual meeting uh, this week. And I will be leaving right after service uh, to go to that meeting. And there's just a lot uh, going on within the convention. Right now, a lot of really um, big decisions that need to be made and uh, some division. There's just a lot going on. So please be in prayer for this week uh, as all the messengers from all of our different churches uh, get together and, uh, and make some really difficult decisions. So, uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing upon our service. Our Father, we do thank you again for allowing us to gather in this place Father, we thank you that, Father, we don't gather uh, as people without any hope. Father, we know that you are a sovereign God on your throne. And Lord, that all things work together uh, for your glory, for our good. 
And so, God, we just thank you again for the promises that we have in your word that, Lord, no matter what's happening around us, no matter what may be coming at us, uh, Lord, we know that you are in control, and we thank you for that, and we thank you for that knowledge. And Father, we do ask today as we come and continue to sing songs of praise to you that it would be pleasing to you. Father, we ask as we come and as we open up your word, Father, that you would speak to us through your word, Lord, that you would instruct us. Father, I pray today as we come and to discuss the very broad topic of your love for us. God, give us understanding. Father, help us, uh, Father, to, uh, to know you better, uh, to love each other more. But Father, but to see things, God, in the way that we should see them. And so, Lord, we ask you to bless that time of preaching and teaching, that it would be for the good of your people and the glory of your name. We love you, and we thank you for loving us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. No, that is not a typo in your bulletin. The choir is singing a song called He Lives because that is a wonderful topic that we can uh, talk about all day long, how the Lord is living, how he is not one of those gods of the Greeks and the Romans that are not real. He lives. He is a true, real person, and we worship him for that. But this is a song that's a Chris Tomlin song, and it's called He Lives. So I invite you to worship with the choir as we sing.
Thank you for that. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to be getting them out and turning a little short letter of 1 John. 1 John chapter 4 will be the text we're going to start with this morning. We'll be in different places, but 1 John chapter 4, if you're not uh, familiar with your Bible or new to Bible study, just go toward the back of your Bible, it'll be back there. 1 John chapter 4, we're going to read verses 7 and 8, and then also verse 16. And a message that I've entitled today, The Love of God. 1 John 4, pick it up in verse 7, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God, and anyone who does not love does not know God, because, and here it is, God is Love, And if you go down to verse 16, we see that again. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the songs that have been sung. And Father, we do ask now as we come and Open up this portion of your word. Father, we do ask that you would teach us. Father, we pray that you would help us to have, Father, understanding. And Lord, and I do pray today that if there be one here who's never received Christ, God, that today would be the day. Lord, that you would open their eyes, unstop their ears. Father, help them to see. Show them their need for Christ and their need to be forgiven. So, Father, we pray that you would use your word today to speak to us. And may your word not return void. We pray in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Well, in his book, a book called Love Wins, former mega church pastor, now heretic, guy by the name of Rob Bell, In his book, he discusses the topics of heaven and hell and of the love of God. Now, to say that this book is a disaster would be to insult disasters. Uh, It is a mess. It is a hot mess. And so don't write the name of it down because I really don't want you to remember it. But one theologian who did an extensive review of the book... He made this statement. He said the theology, talking about the theology within the book, he said the theology is heterodox, which means it's not orthodox. It's outside of orthodox teaching. The history is inaccurate. The impact on souls is devastating. And the use of Scripture is indefensible. Worst of all, love wins, demeans the cross, and misrepresents God's character. Other than that, I'm sure it's fine. So it's not very well thought of. To get the gist of the book, it has been summarized this way. And this is what this is the what the book is trying to communicate. Hell is what we create for ourselves when we reject God's love. Hell is both a present reality for those who resist God. And a future reality for those who die, here it is, unready for God's love. Hell is what we make of heaven when we cannot accept the good news of God's forgiveness and mercy. Now here it is. Now here's the linchpin. Here's the catch for you. But hell is not forever. God will have his way. How can his good purposes fail? Every sinner... Here it is. Every sinner will turn to God and realize he has already been reconciled to God either in this life or the next. There will be no eternal conscious judgment. God says no to injustice in the age to come. And he does not pour out wrath, although we bring temporary suffering upon ourselves. And he certainly does not punish for eternity. In the end, Bell says, love wins. Love wins. So there you go. All right? There's no hell. 
At some point, everybody will be saved. He's a universalist. No need for the cross, no need for Christ to have come and died if ultimately everybody uh, is saved. And all that matters is that God is love and His love uh, will win in the end. So for that, if that's true, then we can just pack it up right now and go on to the house and not come back if we're all going to be saved. Uh, don't do that. Stay where you are. It's not, it's not true. All right? And the reason I point that book out to you is to show you how the love of God can be twisted and manipulated and misunderstood. You see, and this example here with Rob Bell and this book, Love Wins, is kind of an extreme example. But the misunderstanding and manipulation and stuff of, of the love of God is seen throughout our culture and even in churches. And so the point of bringing that book up is to show you how the love of God, I believe, is one of the most misunderstood of all of God's attributes uh, that He has. People, much like Rob Bell, they will take some view that they hold about love uh, and they impose that view upon God. People can believe all kinds of things about love. They can believe love is accepting or Love is unconditional. Love is never judgmental or whatever view of love that they may have. They will take that view and they will impose that view upon God. And for a lot of people, it's hard for them to imagine that God would, that He would think differently than they do or that He would feel differently than they do about the topic of love. And so this is where we see a lot of the confusion. But here's what we need to understand is that God's love encompasses so much more uh, than a love that is patterned after our own mere human emotions. We can't impose our sense of love or even fairness or anything like that upon God. He is different. And here's the proof for this. You don't have to look any further about people's understanding of love. You don't have to look any further than out into our culture right now. Uh, look at the TV or the radio and you'll begin to learn and begin to see what people define and believe uh, love to be. I need to remind you that we are seeing sin celebrated this month all over the televisions. So much, in fact, even fast food restaurants and candy makers have gotten in on the deal. State and federal governments in on the deal. All of it for this month and all of the celebration of sin and depravity is all wrapped and cloaked in this idea of love. It's loving. And if you don't accept everything the culture is putting out and everything that the culture is pushing on you, then guess what? You're not loving. You're the one with the problem. Why? Well, God is love. Certainly Christians understand that. And that's what we hear coming back at us. You see, our enemy, he is a very shrewd enemy. He's a very clever enemy. And, uh, and the vast majority of people in our culture, and even in churches, are very undiscerning. And you take this combination of a very clever enemy and undiscerning people, and you put those together, and you have a recipe for what we see uh, going on uh, in our culture today. You see, the devil's job is to take the glorious truths of God and to distort them. And he does it all the time. And he turns them on their head. And the devil has taken the glorious truth that God is love. And he has twisted it in such a way that now love is used as an acceptance and a justification for sin. And we see it all over the place. And because of this, and many other strange cultural views of love uh, that are out there it distorts what God's love truly is and how Scripture uh, defines it. And here's the thing. God's love has been radically, and I mean radically, sentimentalized in our culture. And the results have been very troubling. Uh, former theologian A.W. Pink, he captures the plight of many when he says this, and I quote, There are many today 
who talk about the love of God, who are total strangers to the God of love. You see, we see a culture out there, and that's true for, in his time, it's just as true today as the culture likes to take capital from God and apply it uh, to them. They like to take what they want from God, and they really don't know God, and they apply it to their lives. And so when John here in this text that we just read, when he says that God is love, he's making a very profound statement, a very deep and profound statement. And what we need to understand is this, about this, about love. God is not just loving. Right? God doesn't just do loving things. He doesn't just express love. He does all that. But God is love. He is love. He is the very definition of what love is. Without Him, we would have no concept at all of what love is. He is love. That means His nature and His very essence are love. Love permeates His very being and it infuses with all of His other attributes to make God who he is and we can't take him apart he is who he is the evangelical dictionary of theology states it this way and i quote god in his very essence is described as being not only holy spirit light and a consuming fire god is also love god does not need to attain or attempt to maintain love it is the very substance and nature of God. To say that God is love implies that all His activity is loving activity. If He creates, He creates in love. If He rules, He rules in love. And if He judges, He judges in love. End quote. It's who He is. It's not so much what He does. It's the very essence of who he is. And so in the text that we've read this morning, we find John speaking a lot about this, uh, this theme of love, about the subject of love. If you were uh, to do a quick little simple outline of 1 John chapter 4, you can outline it this way. In verses 1 through 6, we see some marks of a true believer. In verses 7 through 8, we see that we are to love one another because God is love. In verses 9 through 11, we are to love one another because God has loved us. In verse 12, we see that we are to love one another because by doing so, God's love is perfected in us. And then in verses 13 through 21, John changes from why we should love to the realities of what the love of God will produce in our lives. That's a quick little outline. So we see this theme of love running throughout this portion of John's writing. But what I want us to do this morning, I just want us to think about something a little differently. I want us to look at those three little words that we see in, in verse 8 and in verse uh, 16. That is, God is love. What does that mean and how does that affect our lives? And how, or how are we to understand God with this, right? So I want us to focus here and attempt to give you a little better, hopefully, understanding of what the love of God is. Now, let me just say that <clears throat> this is not everything that needs to be said on this subject. Uh, it's, uh, it's not even close. I'm just going to scratch uh, the surface a little bit. But my hope here is that by having a little better understanding, you'll be better equipped uh, to resist and to discern really the false and unbiblical cultural narrative of what love is supposed to be. That you'll have an arrow for your quiver to fire back. I also want to try to demonstrate why we can't take God's attributes and isolate them from one another. That we have to take them and if we're going to understand who God is completely and again, have a big view of who God is, we got to understand his attributes go together and they don't, we can't separate them. You've probably heard me say this before many times, but for whatever reason, the love of God is the one attribute of God that we have taken and we have elevated it above all of His other attributes, right? That's the one that we put at the top, and, and many uh, probably do that because a God that is loving is easy to deal with, isn't He? He makes us feel good. And so we take the love of God and we elevate it above all the others. 
and we lift it out and we hold it up. But by doing so, what we end up doing is creating an unbalanced view of who God is and a distorted view and many times an unbiblical view of who God is. And by having an unbalanced view, we can fall into all sorts of not only theological issues, but really practical issues and how it's lived out in our lives. Because believe it or not, theology matters. <laughs> what you believe about God matters. What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. A.W. Tozer said that, right? So that all this matters. And also, having a distorted view of God, it dishonors Him. And it causes great damage uh, to the eternal good of people. And so we want to try to avoid that. So with all that said, let's just see what we can learn about God's love and some of his other attributes and how they go together. All right, so when the Bible says <clears throat> that God is love, when you read that in your Bible as you're studying, you should stop and say, okay, now the Bible is telling me something here about who God is, right? God is love. It should, it should draw your attention. Okay, what is it's telling me who God is? Is However, God is love is not the only way God is referred to in Scripture. We also see in John chapter 4 and verse 24 that God is spirit. Notice what it says. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So God is love, but God is also spirit. He's not a spirit. He is spirit. Okay, so what does that mean? Mean. That means that uh, God as spirit is free. He's the freest of all creatures. He is under no obligation uh, to do anything. Right? He is free. He is not limited uh, in any way at all. And if you know the context of John chapter 4 here and where this text is taken from, you know Jesus here is talking or engaging the woman in Samaria, trying to help her understand the nature, what the nature of true worship is. Uh, really is. And in doing so, he tells her God is spirit. Right? So she has this understanding. She's trying to, to limit God. She's trying to put God in a, in a little box. And she has this understanding that God is somehow tribal. Right? And that uh, he can only be worshipped on this mountain or he can only be worshipped in Jerusalem. That's the context of what he is talking about. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not true at all. You're, you're limiting God. God is spirit. He goes after her misunderstanding and he makes the point that, look, location doesn't matter when it comes to worshiping God. What matters is the nature of God himself. And then Jesus said to her that God is spirit. He's limitless. He's free. He's completely free. He doesn't have a body like we do. He's not limited in the ways that we are limited. God is not subject to the limitations of time or space uh, or the impositions that are imposed upon us. He is completely free. He is spirit. But the Bible also says that God is immutable. That word just simply means He doesn't change. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, He says, I, the Lord, do not change. I, the Lord, do not change. Now, what does that mean in the context of God's love? He's free. He's spirit. He's immutable. He doesn't change. That means that God is free and not subject to the passions and emotions like we are. All right, let me give you an example. How often are we influenced by things that happen around us? All right? Think about it. Well, you let something happen in Washington, D.C., <laughs> And y'all get your back up on it. I've seen it. Right? We're influenced by things that happen uh, around us. Right? There, there are certain things that come into our lives, certain situations or circumstances that come into our lives, and it affects us. One minute we're, we're happy and things are going well, then something happens and all of a sudden we're mad or, or something's going on. Right? And so we're heavily influenced by things that are many times out of our control, and we react to these circumstances in certain ways. And because of this, we experience pain and we experience regret and sorrow and uh, mourning. We also experience joy, happiness, right? All these things that happen to us, all these emotions that get brought up in us and because of circumstances that happen in our life. Well, here's the thing. 
God's not like that. He's not like that. Right? He, he, he's, not, uh, he's not subject to these things like we are. God's free. Right? We're not. We're influenced by things that happen to us. God's not like that at all. Every expression of God is under complete control and voluntary control. Okay? There are no fluctuations. When we think about the love of God, there are no fluctuations in God's love, which is clearly different from us, isn't it? Our love fluctuates all the time. All right? There are times where you, you know, you're loving somebody real good, and they'll make you mad, and all of a sudden you don't love them so much anymore, right? That only happened to me. I mean, I don't know. You know, somebody said one time, he said, you know, marriage is supposed to be a 50-50 proposition. I said, that ain't true. <laughs> Sometimes it's 90-10, depending on what day you get up, right? But we, we, we are affected by things, right? God's not that way. He's not that way at all. And so that means that God's love is always free. And there's nothing, friend, listen. There is nothing that can be done to earn it or to deserve it. God freely gives it. He's uninfluenced. God doesn't, as I heard one person say one time, God doesn't fall in love with you. Okay? He doesn't fall in love with you. God chooses to love you. It's a difference. And just so like God doesn't fall in love with you, well, guess what? God's not going to fall out of love with you either. Like a lot of people do when they say when they're getting divorces or whatever. Well, I just fell out of love. That's not the way... God works. Now, here's what can happen. Now, our obedience matters, right? Our obedience matters. But our obedience doesn't affect the love that God has for us. Our obedience affects our fellowship with God. There's a difference. We can fall out of fellowship, no doubt, right? And, and as we're obedient to God, we have a closer relationship. So, so when you think of yourself, well, you know, you, you kind of slipped up, you're in sin, man, something's going on in your life, you think, man, God must not love me right now. That's not true. Now, now it breaks the fellowship you have with Him, no doubt. Or when you're, when you're clicking on all cylinders, you know, and you're reading your Bible good, and you're praying good, and you're witnessing good, you must think, man, God must sure love me a lot right now. It's not true. He don't love you anymore than He did for you started all that you have better fellowship with him and you're probably feeling that relationship with him more but understand God's love he chooses to love it doesn't fluctuate uh, like ours does and so what this does for you and what this does for me is that it frees us up from trying to earn God's love why because it can't be earned it can't be earned God simply has chosen to love you and friend you need to rest in that you just need to know that. If you're a Christian, you're here, and you're in Christ, He loves you. And there's nothing you can do to change that. God is love. God is also spirit. God is also immutable. But then it says something else. Scripture does. It says God is light. God is light. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says this. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaimed to you. Uh, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Again, what does this have to do, or how do we understand the love of God in terms of this, of God being light? Because remember, God is light. It's describing who He is. Well, what do we understand about God as He's described as light? Well, we know that light represents what? Holiness. It represents purity, uprightness, goodness. All those things is what light represents. Darkness is the exact opposite, right? It represents moral wickedness, perversity, and sin. The Bible says that God is light. He's holy. He's good. He's righteous. He's all this. And in Him is no darkness at all, no sin, no depravity, no perverseness, none of that stuff. So that's who He is. Therefore, the God who is love is also the God who is holy and righteous and just and here's the thing any conception that you have or anybody else has any conception that you have of God's love as being tolerant of sin friend is inherently wrong and a bad conception 
And I think this is where our culture misses it. This is where they miss it. Here is why only focusing on the love of God can lead a sinner not to God, but can actually lead him away from God. When we present an unbalanced God to people, friends, <clears throat> we're not doing them any favors. Trust me on that. All right? So many people think that we can live any old way we want to. Why? Because God is love. And somehow in their mind they think, well, he just doesn't care. He's going to forgive me because that's what God does. He's this nice, benevolent grandfather up in heaven somewhere who's just, uh, you know, wants to bounce me on his knee or whatever. That's not how he's presented. God's love will never, friend, listen, never allow him to indulge his people in their sin. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Because God is love, he disciplines his children. He disciplines us when sin is in our life, right? You ever had the discipline of God upon you? It's because He loves you. It's just like being a parent. I love how somehow when we get old, we get reversed, right? As parents, we know we discipline our children because we love them. We want them to act right and do right and do all these things. Well, God's the same way with us. But somehow when we get old, we want to be the kid. You know, well, God don't, you know, the, the kid, you know, you say, you say to your, uh, your parents, you say to them, this is going to hurt you more than it hurts me. Right? The kid was like, yeah, right. Well, we're that way with God, aren't we? But this is exactly what he does. He loves us because he is love. He must discipline us. God's holy love results not in acceptance of sin, but in discipline in a way of correcting sin in his children. So God's love is a holy love. Listen, it is a sanctifying love. It's what it is. That's why when you hear, you know, you, just get, I'm getting on a soapbox. This is why when people preach, you know, cheap grace, all you got to do is walk an aisle, say a prayer, man, and you'll be fine. No, listen, friend. God's love is a sanctifying love. If God gets you, he's going to keep you, and he's going to sanctify you because he loves you, and he shed his love abroad on you. I don't care how many prayers you prayed or aisles you walk, man. If you're not being sanctified in your relationship, if you're not becoming more like Christ, friend, you need to be concerned. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. We all have ups and downs in our life. We get that. But there is a movement toward Christ's likeness that should be happening in your life. And that's evidence of God's love for you. His love is a sanctifying love. His love is not the kind that says, well... I guess they're just doing the best they can. You know, they're only, uh, you know, they're only human. I'm afraid it's what a lot of people think about God and how He deals with people. But there's such danger in that kind of thinking. Again, that doesn't draw people to Christ. It turns them away. And, and listen, it's not just happening in our culture, friends. It's happening in churches, too. How many churches and Christians... Professing Christians have stopped challenging sin and stopped challenging sinful behavior because, well, I want to be seen as loving. Or, or, or we'll hear something like, well, we don't, you know, we don't want to run them off. <laughs> I don't want to run them off. So we just withhold truth. Now, listen, it's true. We don't need to be jerks to people. I understand that. And we need to be nice and we need to be loving towards people. But hear me. Withholding truth from them. That is not loving. It's the most unloving and self-serving thing that we can do. We have truth. If, if we actually believe that sin will send people to hell, if we actually believe that, then not to tell them and not to expose sin, how is that showing love at all? It's not, actually, is it? It's showing hatred. And if we actually believe that people die and go to hell, and we, we don't tell them because we don't want to be seen as unloving, or we don't want to run them off, listen, friends, we, we've got it all backwards. God loves us enough to tell and to expose sin, and we're called to follow His pattern. Don't love someone straight into hell and think you've done them a favor because they felt good with being around you. Love them enough. Love them enough to tell them the truth, even if it costs you the relationship. Even if it costs you the relationship. You know, Jesus said, I've come to bring a sword. I'm going to divide mother and daughter, father and son. 
Truth does divide. But friend, the most loving thing we can do is to tell people the truth. The most unloving thing we can do is to withhold it from them and think we're doing them a favor by putting our arm around them and walking through life with them on their way uh, to hell. It's the most unloving thing we can do in that. God does not love absent His holiness and righteousness. He does not love absent of those things. He loves in conjunction with those things. And if you have a view of God and a view of God's love that makes light of sin, then, friend, you have the wrong view. Because that's not how He operates. He loves. And He is love. And so, what is this love of God all about? Let me try to put a bow on this and finish it up. J.I. Packer gives us a great definition of what love, uh, what God's love is. There's other definitions out there. I just found this one to be helpful. He says, God's, he defines God's love as, I quote, an exercise of his goodness toward individual sinners, whereby having identified himself with their welfare, he has given his son to be their savior and now brings them to know and enjoy him in covenant relationship, end quote. That's God's love. That's what he does for us. Right? And I want you to see if we can, and, and I'll finish this up. I want you to see how much greater uh, an understanding you'll have of God's love if you see it in, not in isolation, but in the context of who God is, right? Uh, how is, is the totality of God's love best displayed in our life? Remember, we're, we're trying to get a big view of who God is. So how, how is the love of God best displayed in its totality? In light of all of his other attributes, well, you have to look no further than the cross of Christ, right? It is at the cross where we see all of this coming uh, into play here. It is at the cross that we find the love of God. It's at the cross where we find the justice of God. Someone has said one time, at the cross is where uh, the love of God and the justice of God kiss. It's this beautiful picture. You see all of God's attributes. You see His love for people. You see His hatred of sin. You see His justice. You see His wrath. You see His compassion. You see His righteousness. Everything is right there for all the world to see in the cross. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16, he says, By this we know love, that He laid down His life for us. You see, friend, it's the cross shows us that God freely chose to love us and that nothing we can ever do or ever will do can earn it or deserve it. There's not any good works you'll ever be able to do that will justify the cross. It is God freely choosing to love and to glorify Himself. The cross shows us that God's love, it shows us God's love in such a way that He didn't just, you know, tip His hat to sin. He destroyed it. And that's exactly what He wants to do in our life as well. He wants to destroy the sin in our life. Because God is love. All that He does is love. Because He is light, all that He does is pure and holy and righteous. His love is not and cannot be indulgent and blind to sin. And His Justice and holiness can't be indulgent and blind to sin either. Listen, it is good for us and right, I think, for us to go and to love others, to go and to share the love of God as far and as broad as we can share it. But dear friends, listen to me. The love we're sharing must be a biblical understanding of what the love of God is. That's the love we need to be sharing, not some surfy, sentimental, sin-coddling, cultural distortion of what love is. We need to share what the Bible says about God's love. And we have explained to us in our Bibles that God is love. And that love will never fail. However, we must be careful not to get it flipped on its head. You see, God is love and that will never fail, but when love is God... It'll fail every time. Why? Because we make an idol out of it, don't we? 
we elevate love to some mystical level, and that's what we're worshiping instead of worshiping God who is love. It's altogether a difference. Let me close with this glorious truth for the Christians here in the room concerning God's love. Now, I don't have time to go into all the different verses that explain this, but <clears throat> there is a special kind of salvific love that God has for His people. And it's all over uh, the Bible. There's a general love that He has, no doubt. But there's a special kind of love uh, that God has for His people. Again, that's why preaching cheap grace is so dishonoring, because that love that God has for His people is a very costly, costly love. But he has this special love. And as I was studying through this this week, I, I was reading in this book about God's love. And I read this little portion in it that kind of just took me back for a minute. And it caused me to really think about some things. But in John chapter 3, verse 16, most famous, one of the most famous verses uh, in the Bible, it says it best. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, uh, but have eternal life. We know that verse well. And the guy in the, this book, was writing this book, he says, so often the glory of that verse gets overlooked. He says this, John 3.16 emphasizes not so much the width of God's love for all humanity as much as it highlights the depth of God's love for His people. He says, so often we want to focus on the world part. God so loved the world. But notice what it says, but He gave. God gave. That is a depth of love that you and I will never be able to fully comprehend or understand. There's a glory in that, that God has for His people. He gave, and He didn't just give anything. He gave Christ. And we see a depth of God's love for us in Christ. And we find in Christ, if we're looking, all we'll ever truly need, or all we'll ever truly desire. And I pray that we can see that separating God's love from all that God is, it sets us up to have a distorted uh, view of who God is, and really a distorted view of ourselves as well. His love is only truly realized and understood in the context uh, of who He is. You see, God's Love is a love that can't be earned. It is a love that loves you so much that it seeks to change you and to make you more like the one who loves you most. That's what God is doing in your life. So we should seek the one who died for us, the one who loves us, and the one who is seeking to make us more like himself. Will you bow your heads and... Close your eyes. We'll come to a, a moment of invitation. And friend, if you're here today and you're outside of Christ, like I say almost every week, I don't believe you're here by accident. I believe God has ordained that you be here. And the fact that you are here is a demonstration of His love in your life, that you can come and hear that you need to be forgiven. Now, there's grace available, if you will, but repent of your sins. If you will bow the knee to Christ, if you will repent and turn from your own way of living, doing your own thing, and submit your life totally and completely to Christ, the Bible says that that is the true condition of your heart, that you will be forgiven. He says He'll forgive you. And He'll begin to make you the person that He wants you to be. And all this talk about all the love of God that we've been talking about this morning, you will begin to experience it afresh and anew. I ask you today, will you repent and come to Christ? Jesus is there with arms wide open and He loves to save sinners just like you. If you're here today and you're a believer in need of a church home, the doors of this church are open. We ask, we're going to invite you to come and We'd love to take and talk to you about what it means to be a member here at Sardis. But for whatever decisions that are going to be made this morning, we're going to give God the glory. So, Father, we do ask today 
God, that you would do and move upon the hearts of your people. Father, for the one who is lost, Father, we pray that you would open their eyes and convict them of their sin. and Father, bring them to faith and repentance. But Father, for all of us in this room who struggle with understanding just the depth of your love for us. God, and I know it's incomprehensible. But Father, I do pray that you would just give us a a fresh understanding this morning. And if nothing else, Lord, help us to understand God, that we cannot earn what you give freely. So, Father, help us to rest in that. Help us to to know, Father, if we're in Christ, if we're truly in Christ, and we're there secure. So bless this time, we pray, of invitation. For your glory and our good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, would you stand to your feet? Be seated. Uh, we want to call a few things to your attention this morning. Uh, we don't have it in the bulletin, but we would like to remind everybody that with next weekend being Father's Day, Father's Day Sunday, we are going to be having a breakfast down in the Fellowship Hall at 9 a.m. For, uh, for dads and their families and parents and men and everybody, and that will be sponsored by the WMU, and that will be next Sunday at 9 a.m. Uh, also next Sunday, we're going to be having a called business meeting. It's in the middle of your bulletin. Uh, for some different positions, but that'll be next Sunday right after the service. So please make sure that you read up on that and have your vote prepared for that Sunday. Uh, Also, uh, very recently we participated in the Cars and Guitars Festival downtown. We got a a lot of um, uh, just time and ability just to kind of be seen by the community and to just show them who we are and a lot of great conversations. So we're going to be having a booth at the pre-fourth, and that's going to be on uh, Saturday, June 26th. And there's a sign-up sheet available in the lobby vestibule for that. We'd love some folks to help out with that to just get the name of Sardis out there in the community more. Lastly, uh, at the very end of the month, we are going to be having a church picnic again. I know uh, for if you're like me, you missed the last year one because of COVID, but uh, we're excited to have that back again. That'll be Sunday, June 27th, so in two weeks, uh, 6 p.m. in the Family Life Center. And so it uh, just has more details on there about that. Uh, Amy is running that for us, and so we appreciate that very much, Amy. And we just encourage you to look at these bulletin announcements, pray about them, see how you can help, and volunteer. We'd love your help with these things. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, so much for this uh, last week of VBS. We just thank you for the people who volunteer their time to just uh, be here to tell children about the gospel and the love of God and what that really means. And this coming next week, we're going to be having Camp Sardis for many of our children and volunteers, and we pray for them and their families that they would hear about that as well. And that in all that we speak about you, Lord, that we would not compromise the truth of that message. We pray for Pastor Michael as he leaves today to go down to the annual convention. Pray for safety for him. And uh, just pray, Lord, for Southern Baptist as a whole, that you would uh, lead us in the direction that you want us to go. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen.